So thank you very much, and we are really delighted to be here. Dayan, uh, most of all, because I mean, I was telling him that this, in this room probably less people he doesn't know what he knows, and also myself. I'm really very, very happy to come back. And Janino invited me a few years ago, but I'm delighted to, to, to be here back. Even because, as you will see, I change uh, quite a bit the scope of my research. And so it would be a different talk, uh, very much so from what I gave a few, few years ago. So uh, the paradigm of the so-called precision medicine, and you know precision medicine from initiatives, for example, from uh, the Obama administration a few years back, is that you start from genetics and genomics, you try to unravel the mechanism, and you lead to a therapy. And then when you go to the therapy, you hope, of course, to uh, find a way to treat more effectively cancer patients. And the precision medicine idea and the whole paradigm has been really pioneered in the last 15, 20 years. If you put also into place the PCGA initiative, so that uh, broader, both US and uh, worldwide, uh, effort to really sequence hundreds, if not thousands, of primary tumors from patients deriving from different tumors, you really get the idea that this is the leading paradigm today for the treatment of cancer patients. I'm not talking, of course, about immunotherapy, but this is actually now the, the other force in the field. But the whole idea of the targeted the drugs going after this genetic genomics alteration is really where we are heading to. And I should mention that also my own lab has really going after this for many, many years, exploiting, among other things, the concept of synthetic lethality, on which you have one lesion that is specific of a tumor cell. And this specific lesion somehow provides a specific liability for tumor cells. So while normal cells do have two pathways that usually in, um, not affected by any mutation or any alteration, even if you block one of the two, the cell can survive fairly well. So you don't have much toxicity in terms of a drug treatment. However, instead, if you have a tumor, for example, which you have a BRCA1, this is the most classical example, that is mutated, you can then inhibit the other pathway. And in normal cells, you will have actually normal repair. But in tumor cells, the, the repair of the cells is really impaired, and you have cancer cell death. So the whole idea of synthetic lethality applied to cancer patients exploiting, of course, genomic lesion present in one or the other one has been really one of the uh, pivotal um, uh, themes on my lab. And second of this is also the fact that we tend to focus more on oncogenes and not on tumor suppressor genes. Oncogenes, in a way, are much easier to handle because you can find a drug that really targeting the mutated gene, and in this way you can actually uh, somehow um, cure the cancer, or at least uh, impair the growth of the cell. For some reasons, uh, and I really don't fully why it happened so, my lab has been always focusing mostly on deletion, more than on, uh, on, uh, than on oncogenes. And one of these is actually a gene that also Janino knows fairly well, it is YAP1, that belongs to the hippo pathway. So this story dates back a few years ago, but basically what Francesca Cortini back then was a postdoc in the lab was able to show is that the YAP1 together with TATS in uh, specifically in hematological cancers, multi-myeloma, also leukemia, is basically behaving as a tumor suppressor gene. While in uh, um, epithelial cancer, for the most part, it behaves as an oncogene, here usually YAP1 is lost, homozygous deletion, and this loss prevents the induction of apoptosis. But then, if you can, in some ways, in some conditions, restore the expression of YAP1, for example, using drugs inhibiting the STK4 that blocks uh, YAP1 expression, you can restore YAP1 expression. In this way, you can induce apoptosis. This was a paper that we published a few years back. What we then asked was, there is anything on top of this DNA damage pathway? So how come that tumor cells do have this ongoing DNA damage that triggers this axis? And what we found, again, in myeloma cells is that two causes are there to induce uh, DNA damage in this cell. One is replicative stress, so you have oncogenes, for example, MYC. MYC induces an increased proliferation of tumor cells, and this triggers replicative stress. And you need ATR to restore and to repair this replicative stress. And this actually, otherwise, you get DNA damage. A second aspect is the, the increase uh, induced by oncogenes or reactive oxygen species. The consequence of this is the increased DNA damage, 
and finally the engagement of the dioxins. What we found on a paper that was published in Cancer Discovery the next year was that basically if you block ATR and in the same time if you increase reactive oxygen species, you can elicit an increase in DNA damage and in this way you induce apoptosis. What we have done as a kind of a follow-up study is for uh, working a little bit more on replicative stress, and this paper is under review, uh, currently under review, we try to see whether we have other means to induce replicative stress. Replicative stress it goes through the ATR, mostly pathway, so we try to see whether the use of ATR inhibition combined eventually with the conventional drugs could indeed uh, uh, trigger this pathway. And what we've been able to find is that actually a drug that is this one here, that has been used to treat a myeloma patient, this hematological cancer we're using for the past 50 years, is really by itself a very strong inducer of repeated stress. As, uh, somehow suggesting that it's so effective in treating myeloma patients, not because it does generically DNA damage to cancer cell patients, but because it induces uh, repeated stress. This is actually the drug, it's called Melphalan. It was introduced in 1950. You should remember that all this uh, huge uh, um, interval of time, there was actually basically no treatment for myeloma patients. So the, the introduction of Melphalan in 1950 was really a major turning point on treating myeloma patients. And still at the present day, Melphalan is part of the treatment for these patients. And what we found, is that when you actually, uh, Melphalan is able to induce uh, um, uh, cross links between the two chains, and these cross links are resolved by the Fanconi anemia pathway combined again with ATR. So, what we tried to see was to combine, and going quickly through this data because the time is running by, but if you combine Melphalan together with a, a specific inhibitor to ATR, you have quite dramatic responses in several different cell lines of myeloma patients suggesting indeed that the combination of the two drugs is really highly effective and most importantly highly synergistic in killing myeloma cells and strongly inducing apoptosis as well. If you do in vivo experiments, you really get quite remarkable results in which basically mice treated with both treatments do not develop DVD almost at all. If you actually look at the survival pool, you have really a huge increase in survival in the mice treated with the both uh, drugs when, when compared with drugs with mice treated with a single drug, as it is here. Going from uh, roughly 110 days, 120 days, to uh, 60, 70 in the, best, uh, in, the, in the best scenario. And in collaboration with Ken Anderson at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, we are trying now to implement a clinical trial in patients combining these two drugs, especially in patients that are highly refractory to the normal therapy, with the assumption that they have a lot of ongoing DNA damage. So combining ATR inhibition with melphalan, we hope we'll be able to overcome the resistance, the drug resistance that these patients show. And actually, these are also patients' data. So we derived cells from patients. We put them in a 3D bioreactor system that is basically a 3D system or which you, you can somehow recapitulate what is happening ex vivo on the patient itself. And indeed, we do see synergistic effect of the combination of the two drugs. I was talking in the beginning that, uh, as a lab, we've been focusing a lot on the deletion. So what we've been trying to do in collaboration with David Chitter, which is the, one of the leading bioinformaticians in the center of omic sciences at San Rafael, to find a way of screening tumor suppressor genes, to find actually novel tumor suppressor genes that could be exploited for therapeutic reasons. Uh, and doing this analysis, we found, for example, there is a, a large subset of deletions in, my, in, sorry, in all cancer patients that show classically hemizygous deletions, so not uh, a homozygous deletion, but hemizygous deletions. And we also found that this large data set of deletions tend to affect nuclear genes. So we just published, and I don't have time to, to go into details on this, um, on this paper, but basically we published a paper which we show that this gene here, PNSC1, is uh, probably the most frequently deleted, hemizygous deleted gene in prostate cancer. And actually what it does in physiological condition is to drive this decoupling machinery inside the nucleoplasm, inside the nucleolus, 
where it basically drives the decapping of uh, two species of uh, snow RNAs that uh, in turn regulates the processing of ribosomal proteins. So the whole idea is that uh, the tumor patients <coughs> lose uh, PNLC1, so this machine is not able to come here inside the nucleolus to regulate ribosomal RNA, so ribosomal RNA can easily go into the nucleus, into, uh, into the cytoplasm, where it's translating into um, ribosome and inducing ribosomal biogenesis. So that's one of the aspects that we, 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 we uh, explore. A second aspect, again, uh, working with uh, David Chitra, was really to take all focal deletions present in the human genome. So there is a tons of focal small deletions in can the cancer genome, and we really have no idea what they are doing. So what we found was that actually you can classify these uh, focal deletions basically in four major groups. Uh, each of them featuring specific uh, characteristics in terms of the position of the genome where they are uh, located, and also, as we will see, um, expression of the genes, of the corresponding genes. If you take, for example, cluster one, this is actually the cluster which the genes are for the most part downregulated. And in this cluster one, you may find the usual common uh, professional tumor suppressor genes. E10 is there, BRCA1 is there, P53 is there, and so on. But we do have also three other classes, the number two, three, and four, on which we have focal deletion, but on which we have genes for which is really not know what, what, what they are doing. And which, for example, the cluster number two has to do with polypore genes. This is actually something interesting because in this case, this is cluster two, you have an imbalance in expression that in some cases goes up regulation, in some other cases it goes down regulation. The, the cluster number three is basically deletion that are happening or heterochromatin, affecting non coding RNAs. So this is actually another class of tumor suppressor or food that is tumor suppressor gene. We really we didn't know anything, and they potentially really are harboring important tumor suppressor genes. But the class that was most interesting for us was the class number four. The class number four unlike the other three, is characterized but not a decrease in expression, but on the overall in an increase of the corresponding gene. So you have something somehow stri striking, that is you have a deletion of a portion of a gene that is not reducing the expression of the corresponding gene, but is increasing the expression. So we try to understand what was the cause underlying this uh, cluster form. So what is doing? What, 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 what is the method? And actually, what is remarkable is that this deletion in cluster 4 do not uh, occupy, do not engage the whole gene, but they're usually very, very focal. So there's only a little piece inside the gene that uh, represents this focal deletion. So it's not that you lose, like, for example, the classical uh, P16 or P10 deletion. You lose the whole gene, and that, of course, removes completely the gene, so you have a reduced expression or absent expression. In this case, you have only a small portion of the gene, a small passage that is really affecting the gene itself. So we wonder what is actually possibly there. If you look at actually at this gene, indeed, when you have a deletion, you have uh, an increase in expression, which is actually um, reducing in the other cases. So we went on and we tried to find some examples to study of this cluster form. We took actually the number, the, more, the third most frequent deletion in human cancer, which is actually in chromosome 4, and it's affecting a gene that is called CCR1. CCR1 is a gene on which there are actually basically three papers out there, uh, so very, very little is known, but do present very, very frequent deletions, up to 80 or 15% in esophageal cancer, for example. Stomach cancer is roughly 10%. So a lot of patients do present deletion in this gene, and we don't know basically anything about what it's doing. If you look at the, this is actually what I was mentioning before, if you look at the, the, the pattern of the deletion, so here you have a gene under here. This is the whole gene from exon 2, basically, up to the end. If you look at where the deletion are, you can see that actually each of the rows represent a single patient. Dark blue means uh, that uh, deep deletion, you see that the deletions for the most part are residing within a small portion of the gene. So they do not engage the whole gene, but for the most part they are present on, the, on a small portion of the gene. 
If you look at the expression of this gene across different tumors, again, what you do see is that you have the, the portion that is deleted, of course, is down-regulated when you compare to all the other tumors. But the portion that is remaining in tumors that do present the deletion is actually up-regulated. So you have an up-regulation of a portion of a gene that is remaining. Of course, you have the gene that, that the portion of the gene that is deleted that is not present or is down-regulated. And at the end, you keep also the last portion of the gene is again up-regulated. What is also interesting is that this deletion here, for the most part, preserves the uh, in-frame reading of the gene. So you do have a production of a messenger RNA that is still functional. It's not lost. So we went on, we tried to figure out what's happening here, and if by any chance there's any element here that may be helpful to understand what is happening there. I would mention also that the portion that is lost usually have a usual, the only domain, protein domain, that is known for this gene that is called coil 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 domain. So what we did, basically, we found the minimal common region that is here, that is commonly deleted in tumors, and we found that in this region there is a pseudogene. And what is interesting of this pseudogene is that it does have a, an antisense orientation when you compare with a normal gene that is this one here. You have an RNA that is expressed here in this direction, and you have an RNA of a corresponding CCR1 gene that is expressed in this direction here. If you use CRISPR technology and you remove this portion here, quite strikingly, you have an increasing expression of a corresponding gene suggesting that somehow the presence and the transcription of this gene here is interfering with the expression of the whole gene here. When you do the same thing with a, another portion of the same intron, you don't see any phenotype on this regard. So the gene is not overexpressed. So suggesting that the TMS ablation triggers CCR1 overexpression. What we did then, in collaboration with the Aging Albini group, uh, Amabile and uh, Lombardo, was to use actually a CRISPR that is linked to a KRAP domain. The KRAP domain, linked to the uh, Cas9, basically represses the transcription of a corresponding gene. We wanted to say and to determine whether only repressing the expression of TMS was able to induce the same phenotype. I should mention also, we tried also to overexpress TMS by itself to see whether it was this RNA or eventually a protein pro produced by TMS that was able to really repress the corresponding gene, and we didn't see any phenotype. So we thought there was a kind of a local heterochromatin um, epigenetic mechanism that actually was responsible for the shutting down of expression of the gene in this direction. And indeed, uh, this is actually explained, but the, indeed, we do see a clear increase in expression when we shut down the expression of TMS. So CCR1, that is the gene that goes in this direction here, increases the expression while we shut out the expression of TMS. The mechanism we think is at play here, we haven't really formally proved that yet, is that we have a polymerase clashing. So the polymerase is going from the CCR1 in this direction, the other polymerase that is going here from TMS in this direction is clashing with the CCR1. It is winning and is preventing the expression of CCR1. So to do this, actually, we also design primers for the intron sequences of the RNA here before and after the polymerase free, after the TMS. And indeed, as expected, we do see a reduction in the expression when you go from here to here. We really suggesting that you probably have a polymerase clashing because the polymerase in one sense is clashing with the other one. You need to remove one of the two polymerase going backward to really have expression of CCR1. So you may ask, OK, but is CCR1 an oncogene? In a, in, in a sense, it's a kind of a dormant oncogene. It stays there. Is shut down by TMS. When you remove by any means, for example, deletion in tumors, the presence of TMS, you may have a gene that actually goes forward. And what we do see indeed is that when you overstress the, the, uh, this uh, CCR1, you do have an increase in proliferation in both uh, HeLa cells and also in more kind of uh, immortalized kind of cells. 
when you look again at the primary data from tumors, you have again the sense that actually there's something funny happening, especially the mito mitotic uh, uh, cell cycle, uh, nuclear division, mitotic nuclear division. So these are the pathways emerging from tumors that present CCR1 overexpression because it's deleted. So we thought there's something funny ongoing at the mitotic level. I'm going quickly through this, but basically overexpression of CCR1 induces spindle abnormalities. So you have actually multiple spindles here as a result of the overexpression of CCR1. You have also aberrant apparent mitosis. And finally, you have an increase of multinucleated cells that are not present in the mock transfected cell. So as a general mechanism, you have increased CCR1 aberrant mitotic uh, behavior and then lead to oncogenic behavior. If you go back to tumor samples and you go again and to check whether you have any indication of chromosomal instability in patients with this deletion, indeed patients with the deletion have a significant increase in chromosomal instability as assessed with the, six, with the signature of chromosomal instability derived from uh, human cancers. Not only that, but if you increase, if you uh, overexpress uh, TMS, so actually if you uh, do a downregulation of TMS, you have an increase in proliferation. But it's basically reverted if you use a mitotic inhibitor, aurora kinase inhibitor, suggesting that patients uh, with this deletion can be treated with aurora kinase inhibitor to really prevent uh, or exploit, in a way, synthetic metallic concept in the beginning the mitotic abnormalities that will be seen the cells of this patient to present. So the summary of this first part is that a large subset of deletions of the cancer genome are associated with increased gene expression, not with a reduced gene expression. A focal deletion or an anti and pseudogene increases expression of the corresponding gene. And finally, the overexpression of CCR1 triggers an aberrant mitosis that could be targeted by raw kinase inhibitors. So up to now, we've been uh, in the realm, really, of uh, targeted therapy. If you have a genetic lesion, even if it's a, a tumor suppressor deletion, it's uh, co uh, usable for this, uh, in, for, for this goal. You try to define the mechanism, you try to find a therapy, a drug, that can target specifically patients with this genetic lesion. And this is the whole enterprise of precision medicine, as we know it so far. I would argue, though, that while these studies are very interesting to find how a cancer thinks and what it does, they may be not actually that useful in terms of therapeutics. For several reasons, I'm just listing a few of them. The first one is that uh, cancer cells usually, this is an observation by Beth Augustine many years ago, cancer cells don't have only one mutation, have several. So as they have several mutations, you may need actually to target many, many different uh, genes to really be able to target comprehensively a tumor cell. Not only that, but besides the usual suspects, P53, KRAS, APC, and so on, most of the lesions that you find in a, in a cancer genome are really specific and characteristic of that single patient. So thinking about developing drugs for mutation or genetic limb that are present only in a small percentage of patients is of course not feasible, given that all the costs that are associated with the generation of, of drugs. <coughs> One of the arguments has been made uh, to sustain anyhow the idea of targeted therapies, but in, indeed uh, all these mutations how belongs to different pathways. So in a way you can you should actually not target the, the genetic lesion, the single gene you should target the pathway. But just to give you an idea on your pancreatic cancers, again, uh, the group of Berbogacy, these are all the pathways that are, that are apparently altered in most pancreatic cancer patients. So first of all, it's really not any more personal medicine. But if you want to target all these pathways in a cancer patient, it becomes really very, very toxic as a, as, as a way of treating patients. So that's probably the first reason because uh, precision medicine is probably, as with a few exceptions, not really going to work. The second idea is that the so-called idea of oncogene addiction. Again, oncogene addiction stems from the concept that you have tumors that do have a specific genetic lesion, and this is actually driving 
the, the tumor. If you address that genetic lesion, you should be able to revert to the previous situation. But uh, in reality, this was actually the, the, the statement of uh, Weinstein 2000, uh, Anton Burns and others had actually really put into question the concept of oncogen addiction. First of all, it's probably a limited relevant for the majority of tumors. In most cancer, you don't have a single, uh, single lesion. When you think about the paradigm of uh, uh, precision medicine, usually people cite uh, CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, or which you have indeed BCRA bone translocation, that's a single region. But most cancers, especially epithelial cancer, have really many, many genetic features. So thinking about the idea of oncogen addiction is really not very viable. And second, and this is probably the most important observation, is that the concept was developed in mouse models. So in a mouse model, it really was like a charm. You have a KRAS mutation, you turn off KRAS and the tumor regresses. You have a CMIC uh, amplification, you turn off CMIC and the tumor regresses. This is really not the case of on most cancers in most tumors. But probably the third, the most important uh, reason, because the concept of precision medicine is not going to work, is that uh, uh, cancer is really a clonal evolution disease. So being able to really, even if you target some of these uh, 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 trees, uh, you will get definitely branches of the trees, you will definitely get a basically a resistant graph. Because really cancer is really undergoing cancer evolution paradigm. So it's really able to somehow organize itself. So even if you hit one kinase, one uh, whatever gene you can think, the cancer will really find ways as a population, as a whole population, to really bypass this situation. So for that reason, as a lab, uh, we keep uh, the part of the uh, if you wish, genomic uh, mechanism and therapy, because nevertheless, it really provides very important insights on cancer biology. But if you really want to address the most important uh, theme that, uh, today present in cancer, in the cancer field, that is how we can overcome resistance, I don't think that a, a cancer, a, a precision medicine approach is going to really solve the problem. And for this reason, we think, I think, uh, but really, instead of this linear model, we should actually think about kind of a circular model like this one, or this really cancer evolution is really important in this regard. Mm -hmm. So as a lab, and also uh, thanks to the work of Diane uh, prominently and so all other people in the, in the center, we're really moving forward to really understand the concept of cancer evolution and how we can exploit cancer evolution to really address this uh, big issue in this area. In this so, so tumor resistance really has really been for a long time the problem in cancer biology. And I should mention that has been always seen as a genetic business. And this is actually derived from a Louis and Deborah paradigm in 1943. It is probably one of the most beautiful papers ever done, on which basically they try to address the point whether the uh, mutation, the virus sensitivity and virus resistance was arising for spontaneous mutations or from acquiring immunity. And what they came to realize is that most of cases this is probably a, a genetic mechanism and not that uh, this is the famous uh, uh, picture in the paper. It's really a genetic mechanism. It is not uh, an acquired epigenetic mechanism. It's uh, basically Darwin and it's not Lamarck to kind of simplify a little bit. And indeed, actually, many, many uh, resistance mechanisms have been really involved with the mutations in, in the pharmacokinetics or pharmacodynamics involved genes. So this is a very first assessment. However, basically, the same year, uh, 1944, in bacteria, a completely different perspective actually was put forward. In bacteria, resistance, and this is a paper that came out in 1944, uh, was suggesting that the resistance to penicillin is really not mediated by genetic alteration of the bacteria population, but is more like a tolerance or persistence mechanism. Up to the point that, indeed, while you think about resistance, this is classic also in the bacteria field, on which you get resistant bacteria because you get specific mutation specific genes. Alongside, you have also the concept of tolerance, on which you don't have a genetic, but you have an epigenetic mechanism to really uh, induce uh, resistance to, to antibiotics. And actually, we have also the concept that is very, very much in the same line of persistence. You have a subpopulation of cells 
the entire kind of a dormant state. And it's in this dormant state that is purely and only epigenetic, they can resist uh, to the therapy they are giving to the patients. So my point here this, uh, in this concept is that the um, tumor resistance or resistance and also in general evolu cancer evolution has to do not only with genetic mechanisms that are indeed important, but also with epigenetic mechanisms. And actually, we, we just started this work. And uh, basically, the whole aim what we are trying to tackle is that do exist also tolerance and persistence uh, in mammalian system. And to do this, uh, we decided to go with single cell genomics. Because since we are dealing with the population level changes and modification, we argue that only a single cell genomic will allow us to define the um, genomic and epigenomic alterations at the population level. And to this end, we just actually won this uh, um, accelerator uh, award that is basically Cancer Research UK together with IRC, on which we have engaged there. It's ourselves, we are leading the effort together with the Polytechnic of Milan and Bicocca also with Mel Greaves and Andrea Sottoriva and Nicola Valeri here at ACI in London, ICR, Bats, Cambridge, and also Norwich, as well as uh, Ido Amit in Israel and, and other people as well. So the idea would be to really find, to, uh, to define this is actually also, we engage also companies in this effort to really try to find a way to define and to bring it to the clinic the genomic and epigenomic of cancer evolution. And the problem actually is, is uh, divided in two major assets. Uh, the first one is to define if the therapeutic regimen will be effective in this specific patient, but also when resistance will develop to be able to anticipate resistance to overcome. So I'm not going to into details about the problem, just uh, let me explain to you. We are actually trying to divide using organoids a platform to really define resistance mechanism up to the bed of the patient. But also, this is the part we are dealing with, is basically trying to combine in a single cell platform, not only single cell RNA-seq, as we are doing uh, commonly uh, in, in the lab in, in, in the center, but also combining epigenomic and epigenetic information into the single cell approach. To this end, actually, this is a one of the examples on which we have been able, for example, this is ATAC-seq, the classical one, is basically able to identify and define only open chromatin region. We have actually a protocol now that we are implementing, or which we have been able to uh, define and also to cover, to sequence, uh, also the closed chromatin, and not only the open chromatin, providing in this way a much broader epigenetic information of a single cell status. If you can see, this is chip, chip seq data, you can see that here we have also single cell data that actually match quite, quite nicely with the HDK9, it is a specific marker of heterochromity. Not only that, but you can actually use this assay, and again, this is the work of Dan, of uh, Davide Cittaro, Francesca Giannese, Martina Tedesco, basically in which you can not, not only get information using this tool on the epigenomic and epigenetic, but also on the copy number variation, again, at a single cell level, with a level and uh, with a degree of uh, specificity that is really much higher than you can get with a normal a single cell ataxy. So let me show you, to, to conclude, some example about some of the studies we are conducting. So we are not using at this stage at least uh, uh, organoid as yet. We are using single uh, cell lines as to serve the system. And we've been inspired by this paper published in 2010 by the Eric Lander group, on which basically they found that if you expose tumor cell lines to drugs, these drugs, the resistance that develop is not only uh, emerging as a classical resistance mechanism. We have a genetic lesion, and this genetic lesion allows the cells to survive. But we have a subpopulation of cells that enters in, enter this kind of a dormant state. And entering this dormant state is purely epigenetic. And actually, this is what we are, we are doing in this day. So we have basically repeated the experiment as we did it in the past, to really try to find a way to uh, do, uh, induce the drug, uh, wait until the cells recover, and the drug they recover. And what is interesting, that we, if you stop the drug, the population goes back exactly as it was in the beginning. Really no genetic change at all. It's really basically as it was. 
And what we found, that was actually fairly interesting, is that, of course, these are the two populations, but uh, when uh, we look at the ataxic, bulk, bulk ataxic data, we found that a, um, a big amplification in chromosome 12 on the cells that were actually recovering after drug treatment. And actually, the same thing was present here it is, actually. The, the, the interesting thing that at day 76, uh, while still in drug, the lesion was present. It was completely disappeared after 10 days. So the cells, the tumor cells, basically went back to the status that was before the treatment with the drug. Again, they did not keep any lesion there, but they basically went back. The same thing, actually, there was also a lesion on chromosome 15, pretty much in the same line, and again, completely disappeared after 10 days. And what we gathered also from other data was actually the formation of a double minor. Basically, a piece, an amplification of a small fragment of two chromosomes together, that actually they were combined among themselves, uh, giving, uh, giving rise to a circle, extra chromosomal circular DNA, double minds. This is actually a fairly known phenomenon in uh, the, the extra chromosomal alteration that actually was present in these cells. And what we found was actually that uh, when you look at the initial population, some of the cells already presented before the drug treatment this, uh, uh, the presence of the, this amplification. And actually one cell of them was also present, uh, presenting with a high level amplification. So many, many copies of these extra, extra chromosome, mini chromosomes. When you look at the genes including in this mini chromosome, and also the, in general the feature of the single cell RNA seq of the cells that resisting to the therapy, you can find cell cytomatosis, but also interferon signal. This interferon signal is interesting because it's been invoked as a way of a cell to really respond to uh, drug treatment, but also to respond or, or less to immunotherapies. So we think about basically uh, exploit this, uh, this uh, interferon response inside the cell to be exploited for therapeutic resistance to overcome it and basically to uh, prevent immune evasion. I'm just closing now. This is actually fairly fascinating. Also, Davide, what he did was uh, he explored also RNA velocity. RNA velocity is a way to really find from single cell RNA seq data the direction of an RNA uh, during time. And what you can see is that actually the population of a normal cell is already somehow oriented. Uh, this is a bridge of connection between the two between uh, becoming, uh, being not drug treated and drug treated. And we are still exploring, we understand what are the root cells and why and what are the trajectories of the cells before and after treatment to see if they are really poised to, to become resistant even because they're exposed to the drug. So let me close by this part. Resistant but also persistent and tolerance are probably present in cancer cell. Single cell genomics approaches are uh, probably going the way to go to unravel mechanisms of drug resistance, persistence, and tolerance, so epigenetic and genetic mechanism. Cells with extra chromosomes are modulating the cell population, and uh, this mechanism of resistance, like in that from story, can really expose tumor cell vulnerabilities. So let me thank the people here. This is the people that have been uh, uh, helping us on the first part of the presentation. Uh, I would like to thank the members of the lab. Benedetta Santolico did most of the job on the antisense gene that I was showing in the beginning. Uh, Oronzina Bottoni follow up the work uh, uh, concerning the resistant to API inhibitors. Uh, all the collaborators within San Rafael, also uh, foreign collaborators and, uh, outside the institute. And also for the accelerator grant, single cell cancer evolution in the clinic, the people in the, people in the lab that I mentioned, the center I mentioned before. Davide Martina Tedesco, Cinzia Sala, Cicca Genieve. Thank you very much for your attention.